Hello, everybody. My name is Lat Mackey. Ma I can't even I screwed up my own name in the intro. Here we go. Let's try this again. Hello, everybody. My name is Lat Mackey, and welcome to Games Done Classic, where we look back at legendary GDQ moments with the legends that made them happen. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here on our new day, our new time. This is the first time on a Saturday, so if you're watching us live, welcome. Hope you're all having a good one. If this is your first time here, Games Done Classic is a podcast-type show where we're going to look back at some really wonderful and amazing moments in speedrunning and GDQ history. Thank you so much for being here. A couple of announcements before we get started. AGDQ 2022 online game and volunteer submissions are closed, but stay tuned as more volunteering opportunities are coming up on gamesdonequick.com as we get closer to the event. So if there's still, there's still time and there's still things that need volunteers for them, if you're at all interested, stay tuned. It'll be up there at gamesdonequick.com. If you've missed any of our GDQ Hotfix shows, check out our archive of past runs and shows at youtube.com slash games done quick. If you're watching on YouTube, feel free to join us over at twitch.tv slash games done quick to check out all of our live shows starting most nights around 7 p.m. Eastern. Obviously, if you're watching right now, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, so we're starting a little bit early, but most nights you'll find us starting about 7 p.m. We're going to be shifting some of the times for our GDQ Hotfix shows, so please do yourself a favor and check out gamesdonequick.com slash hotfix for more info. GDQ Sum of Best Segments is now launched on YouTube. What is the Sum of Best Segments? Well, it's a highlight channel with our regular videos, just like our main channel, but they've been edited down, smaller highlight reels for all of our main events and for the GDQ Hotfix. So head on over there, GDQ Sum of Best Segments now on YouTube. After this show, starting right after this show, actually, starting at 7 p.m., is That's Never Happened Before. It's a show about glitches and how they work that will be featured featuring Spiro One with Deo Man as their first episode. Pretty exciting. If you want to stick around, sounds like a great show. Please do. And then on Monday, we have a new lineup on Mondays, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern with No Category Left Behind, a show about category extension speedruns, which you're going to be seeing one today, actually, uh, followed by the Community Spotlight and its new time at 10 p.m. Eastern. Tons of content coming your way on the GDQ Hotfix, all starting at 7 p.m. Eastern on Monday feel free to join us. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a good time. Now, folks, welcome to Games Done Classic. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking back today at Super Mario Odyssey, one of the most competitive speedruns of all time. In just a short amount of time, four short years, Super Mario Odyssey has become one of the most competitive and submitted speedruns on all of the leaderboards. And I am excited to welcome and have joined the podcast today, uh, Dangers and for Dangers, how you doing? Good to see you. Doing excellent. How are you today, Matt? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for being here. And for thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. I'm excited to have both of you. And uh, as you'll notice, folks, we're going to be looking back. The first run we have on the screen right now is a race between uh, Nicro and Fur. And this is from GDQX 2018. But before we get into the run, we have to talk a little bit about the speed run itself and the history of SMO and Odyssey and everything that goes around with it. So, Dangerous, why don't I start with you first? When did you start speed running Super Mario Odyssey? And what kind of led you to take on this, uh, <laughs> this speed run as it is? Well, uh, this is actually a really interesting question for me. I, I feel like I was a little bit of a late bloomer to the whole Super Mario Odyssey thing. Like, Odyssey was the brand new Mario game, and Mario games kind of have a reputation for being really good speed games and stuff. So, like, the the speedrunning community hopped right on Odyssey when it came out, right? Like, that, like as soon as Odyssey came out, everybody was speedrunning it. I actually wasn't even on Twitch. I was pursuing, like, cooking as a career, and I was kind of, like, minding my own business, didn't even know that this was happening or anything like that. It wasn't until, like, April or May of 2018 that I finally kind of hopped on board and it was basically just like something put me out of work for a little while. I had been speed running like as a kid, like as a hobby, like way, way, way back. Um, and it kind of just like re, I, 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 you know, I rediscovered it, I guess you could say. Um, and it was Nicro Vita who I found on Twitch uh, doing world record speed runs. And I was like, you know what? I think I could do that. I think I could probably do that. And so I just decided to pick up a controller, give it a shot. Um, and, you know, three years later, here I am, so. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history, as they say. For How about you? What That's is your right. experience with uh, with uh, Mario Odyssey? So, like, with first picking it up, um, I, I was 
pretty much on board from the beginning. Uh, when the game was coming out and they announced it and everyone was hyping it up as a speed run, which was kind of insane. I remember when Odyssey was like coming out and like leading up to it, everybody wanted to try out this speed run. So I knew I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get in there. I wanted to try a new speed run that was like hot and popular and super competitive because before Odyssey, I had done speed running before but it was usually in like smaller indie games that like varied in size. Like my first speed run was Hyper Light Drifter and I tried some others like VVV, VVV and I had in time. But like Odyssey, like compared to those games, Odyssey was this huge thing. So in the beginning I wanted to try it out. So within the first month I was speed running it and trying to like get good at any percent and catch up to all these people who were like grinding day in and day out. It, it was kind of crazy. Uh, for, I'm glad you mentioned that because I can't remember a game being so hot uh, as far as a speed run goes as immediate as Mario Odyssey was. And uh, it, it's things like that where I kind of wonder if the game is just like develop. They had to have, I, I, I always feel like the developers had to have had some thought or, you know, put some purposeful things into the game that make it so good as a speed run. But the, the, the fact that it caught on so quickly, uh, I don't I can't remember a game that's been like that. I mean, maybe, maybe either one of you have, but it seems like this immediately uh, caught the attention of the speed running community and got a lot of people involved right away. Yeah, you're not wrong about that. I think. You know, a lot of, like, AAA, especially Nintendo titles, tend to get that treatment right out mm -hmm. at the beginning. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, like, we're going to play this because everybody, you know, it's a Nintendo game. Everybody kind of flocks to those really fast. Um, but, again, like I said at the very beginning, nothing quite captures the speedrun essence quite like the platforming Mario games do. Um, and even if a game is speedrun by people, like, ambitiously at the beginning, it tends to taper off quite quickly because not every game is, like, perfect for the grind mentality the whole like pushing things down like i remember pokemon snap coming out for example mm. the, the the brand new one like last year that yeah. game came out and there were a lot of people that were like yeah you know let's try and speed run it it was kind of like more of a joke though you know what i mean <laughs> um and you know it you can only push a game like that so far like there might be a couple things where you're like "Ooh, if we like throw this thing at this time then we skip this pokemon and you're like that's revolutionary. But with a game like this, <laughs> um, it's different, right? Like this, there's always discoveries. Like you can always move faster. You can always figure out how to improve how you're playing. And, you know, that's, I think that's why Mario games do so well. And like if, if speedrunning were as popular as it was, like, you know, in the Nintendo 64 era, maybe, like when Nintendo 64 games were coming out and we had the internet, I'm sure Super Mario 64 would have gotten the same treatment. It just so happens to be that Odyssey was like at this perfect precipice of like, internet popularity, speedrun popularity, and also, you know, being a Mario game with a release and being popular on Twitch, I think. Definitely. Uh, so, for, I'm going to start with you. It's all In, oh, good. Did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Uh, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> uh, what, what, what was the question? Yeah, so I was going to go with, you know, what makes the speedrun so good? I, I got to tell you, uh, I only have a casual experience with it, but it's basically mm. one of my favorite 3d platformers i've ever played i had this i think like like a lot of people because the game got popular the the experience with it as far as platforming go is just there's no real i mean mario 64 is kind of comparable but i still feel like this is like just pure platforming perfection what it, tell me about the speed run and what makes it so good well i i think the first thing to bring up and this sort of applies more when the game was new it was a very open-ended game to tackle, like, especially from a routing perspective. And each of these, like, kingdoms you have to go through, um, your goal is to collect a set of moons, and then um, once you get, like, that set of moons and get enough... Once you get... Sorry, I'm tripping over my words here. Once you get enough moons to go to the next kingdom, you can just go. You don't need a clear, like, a story objective or anything like that. So... Like, figuring out a route that sort of just works it was, like, something that was constantly changing for a very long time. And even, like, recently, I don't remember exactly when the last route change was in any percent, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't like, two years ago or something like that. It's, <laughs> it's been something that's... Pe people keep finding, like, new things or new ways to, like do small bits of movement or, like, tackle different challenges. So I think that's just one of the things. But there's even more to it than that, just because, like, the movement in this game is so, like, just very good, and there's so many, like, interesting optimizations you can make just from, like, figuring out how you can move from, like, point A to point B just, like, a little bit better. 
I know for both you and Dangers did a fair amount of grinding, grinding on this game for quite a while. And so, Dangers, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it over to you. What kind of makes the speedrun of this different or stand out to you as opposed to maybe other speedruns you've tried or other ones you've seen and watched? Well, I feel like I'm kind of uh, categorically a Mario speedrunner. I feel like <laughs> those games kind of appeal to me. And I've noticed um, I, when I started speedrunning like ages and ages and ages ago, I was kind of stuck on 2D Mario speedruns. I thought that those were like the perfect kind of, you know, package for a speedrun game because, you know, there is a correct way to do a level, right? Like if you're going to run through a 2D stage, uh, you only have the one dimension to work with. And well, I guess two, um, and you just kind of you know you you per, you uh, act per, like perfectly in that level, and then you just win. Um, and I thought that that was like the perfect format for a, a speed game. But then when you go into 3D, I realize you know you're allowed to make some mistakes in the 3D space, but it can still be impressive. And so, you know, Odyssey kind of takes that one step beyond even. And not only is it like a really good speed game because there is so much optimizing that you can do, it goes one step beyond and even says like, you know, it's also a quite an easy game to get into. And because the moveset is so versatile, um, you know, the ceiling for improvement is like way up here. Like I wouldn't even say even the best runner in the game has like perfect mastery over absolutely everything you could possibly do. You know what I mean? So um, that's that makes it very captivating. That makes it very um, addictive. Um, and the the whole idea of speedrunning in general is just adding replay value to games that maybe don't have it necessarily. I think that's probably like the most enticing thing about it, right? Is like when you play a Mario game, if you collect all the moons, you know all the puzzles, you know how they all work. You could play the game through again like casually, you know what I mean? But you're not right. going to have as much of an enrich enriching experience playing it the second time because you're going to know what to do, right? So speedrunning adds an external reason to keep playing, I guess. And that's probably what makes it so satisfying. And I think that because Mario game doesn't typically get viewed as a competitive game, you know, getting good at it is kind of impressive when you get to this level. So I think that's an interesting thing to note moving forward as well here is that uh, even the best in the world at this game, uh, current world record holders, there's always still room for improvement. And I agree Definitely. with you. I think that's the thing that really sets 3D Mario's and especially this game apart is that uh, you, you, you know, there's always rooms for improvement. And quite often I hear, uh, or I, I see in commentary of, you know, a world record run or something of that nature that, oh man, I, okay, here's some, I didn't optimize my movement here. This could be optimized a little better. Always t places to save time. And I think that's I think that's one of the things that makes the, the the run endlessly fascinating to watch. Now I want to bring up you know thankfully for for GDQX we can actually see your hands here and you can see uh, Nicro is using a, you know it looks like the Pro Controller <laughs> and, and Fur yep. you're using the the Joy Cons. Uh, what are like I am. <laughs> what are some of the <laughs> basic things to know and learn if you're if you're curious about like picking up the speed? What are some of the basics as far as the speed run tech type of stuff goes? Well, since the controllers got brought up, if you're just Please, you know, yeah. running a category like any percent, it really doesn't even matter. And I mean, heck, even if you're running one of the longer categories, having those like the controller options are mostly just like down to preference at the end of the day. Like most of the people who run Odyssey run on pro controllers. So I'm kind of the exception there running on Joy Cons. But um, so when it comes to like first picking up the speed run and like, what do you want to learn? Well, I feel like one of the, like, th this is really basic, but one of the good things to, you know, just sort of get used to is, like, cap bouncing. Because I feel like bouncing off of Cappy, whenever I see people playing this game casually, it's not something people are very good at utilizing or doing without, like, freaking out or falling off of the level or something. So I feel like that's probably one of the first things to sort of, like, get a hang of as you're just sort of starting to learn how to move Mario faster and faster and then, like, there, there's not really too many, like, specific tricks as a beginner runner you'd necessarily need to learn. Like, Moon Skip is a really big one because that saves literal minutes. Mm -hmm. But there aren't really many small movement things. Like, there's, there's roll canceling, which is pretty useful, but I feel like that's one of the strats that's harder to utilize and unless you're, like getting down to like an hour and 10 minute range or something like that. What are, what are you thinking dangerous? Like what are some of the things to learn? Yeah. That's kind of the thing is like when you have, when Mario's move kit is so diverse, it, it can be 
you know, maybe we even take it for granted after having played the game for thousands of hours, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, for, maybe. you forget what not being able to move Mario is like. And I, I kind of experienced that when I switched over to Galaxy. It was like, okay, so he moves kind of the same as in Odyssey, but he's got a couple quirks <laughs> that make him a little different, right? And you have to get used to those before you can even, you know, attempt to kind of upgrade yourself and be like, okay, well, I can do this level without thinking about it anymore, and I can maybe do this skip without thinking about it. Like, you kind of have to, like, level up in that sense. Um, so, like, moving Mario it seems like a simple statement, just, like, move Mario, you know? It's easy, but it really isn't. Like, if you if you want to have mastery over the movement, like, you, you have to put some time into that, too. Like, you have to kind of get used to, you, you, you know, you, you can't be thinking about the buttons. As weird as that sounds, like, you know, gamers intuitively know how, you know, <laughs> A means jump and Y means dive, but it isn't that simple at the beginning, right? Like, that, you have to get yeah. that into the back of your, your mind before you even, I guess, get to this level that you're seeing right now, so. That's a really good point to bring up, and I saw some actual speedrunners talking about this recently where it seems like, you know, the most basic thing, but spending some time with a game... That's one of the things I think that's great about Odyssey is um, the main the, the main quest, you know, if you want to call it that. Uh, I would say maybe 10 hours, somewhere in that range, but there's so much to do in this game. You really feel like, I, I, as from the casual perspective, like I got a, a, a lot of good experience with a lot of the controls and I still haven't even gotten all of the moons in the game. And now, you know, I'm 20 or 30 hours in or whatever. I, I think that's such an important aspect to speedrunning, especially at a high level is just spending that time and putting in the work. And I think it really, especially for a game like this, where, you know, it, it, the, the movement is so important to saving time and to moving faster and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, a really good point. I, for you brought it up, and I, I think it's kind of interesting to track some of, like, the, the big discoveries in this game. And Moonskip, I remember just being a huge deal uh, <laughs> when that first came <laughs> around. What exactly is it, and how does one pull it off? So, Moonskip is a trick in Super Mario Odyssey. It was found, like, first couple of days the game was out. Um, <laughs> I think we, the runner that discovered it was Zadok Squared, if I remember right. Would we be able to skip to it? I was looking it? at this recently. What? Would we be able to, like, jump to it really quickly? And yeah, sure, actually, yeah. The, towards the end, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, probably yeah. the last, like, ten minutes. Just a little more. Hang a sec here. Uh, did I skip That's it already? Gotta, no, keep going. Thank you for bearing with us as we try to get over here to, because it's, it's, okay, here we go. Okay, so Fur has already Oops, done it, but done. Nicro is doing oh, it now. Oh, Nicro yeah. was on it there we go. Okay. right where you just were. Uh, right here? Nope. Um, Nicro's got to move a little bit forward. Fur's got to move a little bit backward. You can choose. Let's, yeah. let's we'll go with Fur's. All right, here we go. Cool. There we go. Okay, perfect. All right, yeah, so it'll be coming up here in a moment. So basically what's going to happen is on my perspective, I'm going to ground pound on top of the Sphinx, and then I'm going to do a cap bounce up the wall, and I'm going to wall jump in a very specific part of the wall, and that's going to let me wall jump on this other wall over there, and uh, just it lets us skip this entire section in Moon Kingdom that takes, like, literal minutes to get through since... Moon's a very linear level, and like our only goal here is to get to the end. It doesn't matter if we actually do that part or not. So it's a pretty useful trick, and um, it's a bit trickier than it looks because the game does not want Mario to be able to wall jump um, at like walls that are like 90 degrees from each other. But because of the like jagged edges of the cliff face there, um, we're able to sort of just jump up it anyways if we do it in the right spots it, it, I, that, was the, a, that was a trick sure. that was discovered on day one by the way like yeah it was really early yeah and it's great because the opposite like the the thing that you are avoiding you're gonna see it come up on micro screen here too as he rolls up is this like i i kind of call it like the the victory road of super mario odyssey <laughs> because <laughs> it's the same kind of concept as like you're getting to the last stage of the game the only thing that kind of stands in your way is the final boss but oh we're gonna put like a, a daunting kind of platforming challenge in your way and that's the moon cave and that's like this this place with lava and it probably like you know i think the world record for getting through the moon cave from start to finish is like two and a half minutes or something like that um so that's the fastest that you can do it right but most people are going to take like three three and a half minutes there's like a whole other boss fight in there so the fact that we can just kind of jump behind it like this um, right out of the gate, right from day one, was like a huge deal. 
what's the kind of like the trick to learning the trick? And I know that kind of sounds strange, but mm -hmm. from a casual play, like I remember struggling really hard to jump off of 90 degree walls. Like, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm curious, what are the things you actually have to do? Because I remember this being really challenging, <laughs> having to jump off walls. Yeah, this is where like, um, you know, learning speedrun tricks has a lot to do with kind of, you know, having an intuition about the game and also just being a lot more keen to cues. You know, it was like mm. when you when you go from just playing ga casually to speedrunning, you start to dissect the game a little bit. You start to look at it differently. Um, and that's just kind of how it works. For this trick, that, that I couldn't explain it any better than that, really. Like... <laughs> <laughs> you, for that trick to work, you have to basically get your wall jump to line up on a specific portion of the wall. And if you want to do that consistently, you have to be like looking at the wall because the wall's textures are always going to be the same. So you're like, okay, I need to line up with this texture. And then I'm going to throw my cap against it and wall jump. And that should allow me to get the second wall jump. Like it's all about like using what the game gives you as feedback to be able to do it more consistently the next time. I'm going to take us back here and get us back into the run. And uh, let's start talking a little bit about uh, any... Oh, here we go, New Dong City. Perfect. Um, yeah. you're, let's take us about the any percent category. And I noticed that the estimate for this run in 2018 was an hour and seven minutes. Mm -hmm. um, what is the state of the speedrunning at this point? And, and I guess tell us a little bit about the any percent category. How was it routed? How did you kind of get to this point as far as any percent goes? And I guess I'll start with you, Fur, because you're the person uh, running it on the screen. So any... Any percent today or any percent back let's, when? Yeah, let's talk about the it then, and then we can Coex compare run. it later. Yeah, back then. So back then, I mean, it, it was definitely different. Um, I think at the time this run happened, I think I was ninth place in any percent, and Nicro was second. I'm trying to remember what world record was, because this was late 2018. If I remember correctly... So like, um, did, wait, did, yeah. I don't know if Nicro had world record at the time. Did he? I, no, I, Nicro didn't have world record at the time of this run. It might have been Sui. It might have been Sui, Sui Saiga. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's but possible. I don't... Uh, what would it have been? <laughs> it might have been like a... It was probably a low 101, high 100, I think. If I'm if I'm remembering, gonna try right. and look back here. I'm going through uh, speedrun.com as fast as I can. I should have <laughs> had that data up. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Uh, That's all right. Uh, let's see. It looks like and thirtieth. Uh, it looks like um, it's loading. Thank you, SRC. Taking its time, of course. While we're live, you know, <laughs> perfect. It's of not course. going to be go. This is what happens when you have thousands of, like, the, the Super Mario Odyssey leaderboards, by the way, <laughs> I feel like they take the, one of the longest ones to load. Uh, looks like Russia was uh, first place as a, in uh, 2000. Oh, this is 19. My bad. Wrong year. October yeah, I'm going, 1st. I'm going in the way back machine. That is also a good way to do it. <laughs> SRC has a really cool function now where you can actually do it by, uh, by date. But uh, I, I know we were really? I, we we obviously weren't at the sub one hour mark, and I think that's okay. I, oh, Nicro was the uh, we was, were not. was the world record holder. Really, Chaos was in second. Oh, could I? So and for you were yeah, both of you were top ten at the time because that's it's part of the announcement. Yeah, so. I, I know I was top ten, but oh, I, I could have swore Nicro was second. It was probably changing a lot around that time. It was Odyssey, changing like, a lot. That, oh, I just, yeah. I just, Odyssey was. So competitive, especially when it like first came out in the first couple of years of it. And, I mean, it's even still really competitive now. But I remember there being points of time around when the GDQX run happened, where like there were four or five people that could probably get world record at a given time, <laughs> which was kind of ridiculous. This I, just it, it, oh yeah, I just picked a time it, in the Wayback Machine that was like October fourteenth of two thousand eighteen, and Chaos and Equan and Little Curbs all got a time on the same day. Oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> Chaos got like a one oh oh fifty five, and he was the world record holder at that snapshot. So yeah, it was very competitive, very very competitive in that first year. What? Definitely. Now, w w was it the, the movement optimizations? Did routing have anything to do? Like, what were the runners doing? Were you trying different things? I mean, what kind of things were you trying out that was impacting so much of this competitiveness? Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think back and remember, because I know a lot of it, because this game has always just been like, oh, it's, it's movement optimization. People are getting better at, you know, just figuring out how to move from one place to the other. It's not even necessarily like the route changes that are big time saves. But, um... 
I, I don't remember if there was any like major discoveries at this point. Because I know there was a glitch, um, the the moon clipping dangers. I forget exactly what we call that in Wooded Kingdom. Yeah. Do people just call it like? Uh, they they just call it nut clip. Nut clip. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that was back in I think a few months before this, because that was when um, Odyssey was first showcased at GDQ on uh, SGDQ by Nightcrow, I think. So like yes. sometimes those big discoveries will happen and there will be like 20 or so second time saves. But I think it's mostly just been movement optimization and the occasional route change or yeah, because that's kind of how other discovery. Yeah, that's kind of how these games are. These games work, right? It's like we kind of figure out what a route is going to be, um, and we we test them. Like especially when the game is new, uh, we test them and like we pit different moons against each other. Uh, this is a different Mario game, right? Like Mario games typically. Um, they've been more like you enter a level and that level determines what star you're going to get kind of thing. Like think Galaxy or Super Mario 64 where, um, you know, you go into the level with one star in mind and it's just like start of the level to the finish of the level, then you get spat back out and then you go back in. Um, Odyssey isn't like that. Like you collect a moon and then you have, like you basically continue the level from where you were already. Unless it's a story moon, that's different. But um, so the routing was all about like, okay, it's, it's like playing a game of connect the dots, right? You're playing a game of connect the dots. You have to connect the dots and then get back to the Odyssey in order to move to the next kingdom. So, you know, routing is a part of it, and it's a very exciting part of it, but, like, you kind of settle into that really fast if you've got a lot of people working on it, right? Um, it's funny that the history of this game, like, when there has been major routing changes, it's because something's discovered. It's because a trick comes about, and almost always that big discovery happens when, like, a lot of the community or like a major part of the community is away at an event or something. It's very strange. <laughs> like, um, you know, we were talking about Nitro's very first run at GDQ, uh, which was GDQ, uh, SGDQ 2018. So the same yeah. year, but like slightly earlier. Um, that was when the nut clip was discovered. So basically like the Wooded Kingdom basically got just like flipped upside down and we like completely rerouted it and got different moons all of a sudden. It saved like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other major thing that I can think of that changed the game wasn't even a trick. It was just that uh, uh, the version changed, basically. Uh -huh. um, the game updated to 1.3, and because of that, the game started, like, overclocking all the loads. And so 1.0 is actually the version that you're seeing on your screen right now, and it's got a couple yeah. of tricks in it that uh, got patched out, and that was why we played on it, is because it was faster for that reason. But when 1.3 came along... Um, that changed like all the loads got faster and even though you couldn't do any of the tricks anymore The game just loaded so fast that it just like kind of beat out the old version anyways So nothing got added nothing changed it just loaded faster uh, and made it faster And I remember that happening while everybody was at pace 2019 <laughs> which was like the first in-person like competitive speedrunning event hosted by uh, Global Speedrun Association so all of the top Super Mario Odyssey runners were at an event and had to play on 1.0 while the game was like being like going through this revolutionary change back home. Basically, it was wild. So what you're saying is there was a free yeah, world was record, something. free world record available for one day or for a weekend. I mean, <laughs> not necessarily free, but it was. Yeah, it was super funny <laughs> to see that like literally all uh, we had how many Odyssey runners there? There was at least four. Wow. I think there might have been more, but there yeah, like all of the top <laughs> Odyssey runners were there. And they just like they couldn't work on getting a faster time with the the new time save. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you mentioned oh, the uh, the overclocking on the cutscenes. Uh, I have a really noisy fan in my Switch for some reason, and I never put that two and two together. They were actually changing, but it would always turn on <laughs> during the the level skips and now I, <laughs> the you know the cutscenes. And now I know why. Okay, go figure. <laughs> it's a small yeah. Random. Mine sounds a bit like a rocket ship taking yes. off <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. Okay, so that's super interesting. And I, 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 th I think there's an interesting thing to note here is that, you know, in, in traditional 2D Mario games, we're fortunate enough nowadays to have, in fact, have had for a while now, all of these additional things to help us figure out and learn and optimize speedruns to a new level with tool-assisted speedruns, checking how the game, you know, we could, I mean, people have reverse engineered the code of a lot of, of Mario games. I mean, we've gone to uh, quite, quite some really interesting depths as far as like breaking down a game. Do any of those kind of tools or things exist for Odyssey? And I'm curious how we've gone about, you know, 
findings? I mean, obviously some of it's just experimentation. People go glitch hunting, things like that. But are there any tools or anything that, that like, is like that that exists for Odyssey? It's funny that you um, ask, but yes, there is. They're <laughs> yeah. pretty rudimentary, um, and they are very new. Um, the, the idea of tasking the Switch kind of, you know, relies on emulation. Uh, and emulation for the Switch is a, is a pretty new concept. It's not something that's come about um, until recently. Um, I think the way that tasking works now is it basically kind of just, like, takes over a controller for the regular Switch. Like, it doesn't even rely on emulation. I'm not sure. Maybe for you can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I, I really don't know much about the tasking on the Switch, to be honest, so I couldn't really add, to be honest. Yeah, what I do know is that the, the biggest hurdle that we have to come across is motion controls. Mm. Um, because the motion controls are very, like, dynamic in this game. Like, if you shake the controller to the left versus to the right, you can get the game to do different things. If you shake it upwards instead of downwards, you can get it to do different things. Um, and so emulating that is a real challenge. Um, when it comes to, you know, uh, tasks or just emulation in general, uh, which is why it's been so hard to kind of get the ball rolling on that. Um, so it does exist, but I, I feel like a lot of the clips that do exist for it tend to live in the realm of, um, you know, stuff that doesn't involve the motion controls. I think it's become a little bit more complicated, a little bit more um, available to do stuff like that. Like, I think we can do up throws in, in tasks now, um, but nothing has been comprehensively put together as like a showcase for TAS. Uh, what we have instead is something that we call uh, BTT or best theoretical time. Um, maybe Fur, you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so BTT, it's basically something that's been around for a while, but like the core, the core idea of what it is for Super Mario Odyssey is that um, we didn't have these like fancy TAS tools that we could use to, you know, put together a perfect run or like try and figure out crazy strats or whatever. So what people ended up doing was they made this sheet that kept track of like these individual segments of the run and um, it would track like, oh, what is the fastest segment of getting from this moon to this next moon or from this moon to a loading zone or things like that. So instead of having a task, we would basically have this community made spliced speed run that would um, sort of show what the theoretical best time for um, Super Mario Odyssey is. Yeah, so taking it kind of like one step beyond, like, you know, when you think of, when you think of a speed run, you think of like the splits that you've got. Usually you kind of like segment the run, in this case, by the kingdom. But this best theoretical timesheet was to the moon or even like to the, like, you know, from one place to another or something. Like it was like very heavily segmented, but... Um, you know, it's still humanly possible. So people would, like, grind out these, like, you know, five-second segments over and over and over again until they got something that was, like, what we considered at the time to be inhumane. Now that we've got the task tools, though, if you, like, you can probably go on YouTube and search some of these for yourself. Um, now that we have task tools, some of the clips that are coming out of tasks are, like, disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> And there's actually some really great resources. Once again, the best, there's this whole sheet of where, you know, as you're mentioning, of all the different worlds, and you can look up how many frames or what the time is. For example, like two minutes and 38 seconds and 0.533, just for example. And that's, I think that's kind of an interesting and cool way to do it, especially, so as a speedrunner myself, I, I rarely have time, to, I don't have time, unfortunately, to do speedruns that are longer than an hour. So maybe if you're interested or maybe you just enjoy grinding out something small, this is something you could actually contribute and be, because uh, these aren't necessarily done by, uh, world record holders. I mean, a lot of these folks have, but I mean, they're, they're, it looks like it's this is a community effort to put together some of these best of segments, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and I think it. Oh, it, yeah. You mentioned Odyssey community. I think that it. You know, speedrunning Odyssey might take an hour. You're right, and maybe not everybody has time for that. But I think that the overarching Super Mario Odyssey community extends beyond just speedrunning the main game. Like there, there are community elements that go into different facets of this game. Like the fact that you that Mario is able to cross these major gaps with the combination of Cappy has led to like a community of people called trip jumpers, which basically like, <laughs> if I stand here, can I get over there? The answer is usually yes, by the way, because they're <laughs> they're they're crazy. They do like this is what they do is they just try and figure this stuff out, right? Um, and then there's like the mini games in the game, like Koopa Free Running. So there are a lot of people who like to um, try and grind out the Koopa free running races and try and get the best times that they possibly can on those. So like, 
you know, there's there's a lot of different things that you can do with this game if you wanted to actually try and, you know, be good at a Mario game. There's a lot of opportunity here. As a fan, it's one of the coolest and fun things to watch is that typically if you can see something in Odyssey, usually you can get there somehow by jumping. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's kind of, not, not a lot of games exist like that. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's that just adds to the beauty of why it's so fun to speedrun, right? That's that's part of it. And sometimes Nintendo knows, right? Like, uh, recall the, um, you know, the Sand Kingdom boss fight, um, the one with the the knuckle tech, the hands and the, the the head. If you like, go into that room and then turn around. There's like a big kind of stone archway, and if you manage to get up there, there's a huge coin stack up there. Like Nintendo knew that if you had good control of Mario. You could make it happen, like you could get, you could theoretically get up there, so they reward you for it. Or like in Lake Kingdom, the first thing you're supposed to do is like go into an underwater cavern and like navigate some spiky waterways and stuff. But you can also just triple jump and use Cappy to get over a wall that kind of cuts all that out. And they reward you by Cappy being like, "Yo, you did it! What a nice jump!" Like <laughs> sometimes Nintendo knows better, you know. Sometimes Nintendo knows that there are people out there trying to be good at their games. Um, so yeah, I mean, th that's kind of cool. It's kind of like cheeky of them to do that. But at the same time, like you can even push that several steps beyond what they ever expected you to do too. I am convinced that the developers of Mario games throughout their decades of history now, there had to have been speedrunners or people who were interested in playing the game that way. Because some of these paths, especially like in Mario's 1, 2, and 3, just seem like tailor-made for speedrun <laughs> speed oh, routing. I, I honestly couldn't agree more with you. Okay, so my the perfect example for me um, Super Mario World, uh, Yoshi's Island 2? No, Yoshi's Island 3. It's the one with, like, the, the platforms that, like, spin around like this. At the very, like, the, that level's supposed to be really slow because you have to, like, start by jumping up. But speedrunners, they start with a run directly to the right and they use that, like, uh, information block and they jump off of that and keep their running speed throughout the whole level and it works. Like, when I saw <laughs> yes. that level, I was like, Nintendo knows people are doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> They, they have, have to, to know. Yeah, I agree. So somewhere in their testing down the line, people are looking for those routes. I just feel like it has to be a thing. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this run. And well, actually, I'm sorry. Before we get to that, first, we will get to this run in just a second. Um, what was I, I, it's? I know, especially nowadays, for so, as a community and as fans and as viewers, we react to barriers being broken. And for better or for worse, I know sometimes that could be really challenging for speedrunners. Like, we're trying to get to the next, you know, minute barrier or whatever it is. And I, I, it's a real thing. However, it seems like breaking that hour barrier was a big deal. And uh, if you can, maybe just tell us a little bit, when did that barrier finally get broken? And why was that a big deal for the Any% Percent category? Oh, that was that was early 2019, wasn't it? Right, Dangerous? March or April, I think. And yeah. it was Necro Vita. I who think did so. It. It was like, yes. <laughs> there were a couple people on the precipice. There were like Chaos mm -hmm. could have done it. Little Curbs actually got a 1000 flat. Like he got an hour mm -hmm. flat, like three or so weeks before somebody was able to actually do it. So brutal. Um, <laughs> yeah, there were there were a handful of people that could have done it like any day. Um, and it just so happened to be Necro in March or April. Yeah, it was it was early that year. What, As to yeah, why it was important. it was a really big deal. Yeah, I think you know it, there's a lot of things that culminate in that because there are plenty of other speedrun games that like cross over minute barriers and you know they kind of go unnoticed or like it might be a big deal for the communities but not necessarily for the overarching speedrun communities as a whole, right? Like, uh, Sub Hour and Odyssey was kind of this incredibly special thing because. There was, it was almost, you were almost playing team sports with it a little bit. You were like, <laughs> is it possible? No, it's not. It's impossible. It'll never happen. And then you've got the crew that's like, you know, it's speed running. Anything can happen. And they're like being a little bit more realist about it. And so like there was this dialogue, you know, there was this buildup. It's kind of like, you know, Super Mario 64 is probably the most notorious speed run game of all time. Mm -hmm. And it's like the world record actually just got beaten yesterday for 120 star by Liam. Um, and so, like, whenever that record gets broken, everybody knows about it. It's just, like, it's got this notoriety, right? And I think that because Odyssey was the new Mario game in town and because, you know, getting the number down from a five-digit number to a four-digit number is just, like, you know, it's arbitrary, <laughs> but it's clean. And it's, you know, it's got this kind of satisfying thing that just, like, really hits us in the, in the monkey brain a little bit. And we just love it, you know? We can't wait to see something like that happen. So... 
because of all this tension and because it had been like two years since the game came out, we were all just anticipating it with like bated breath. And because it was so contested and because there was so much um, like within the community, there were so many people that could have made it happen. And it was so close um, and there was so much tension. Like, you know, it's, it's just a recipe for success, really. I love it in the chat. March 23rd, never forget. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> the 50 died, 50 oh, died. Oh, man. So, so this run, this is the one you're, run you're watching folks right now on the, on the screen is uh, GDQX 2018. So the game is, is fairly new. I mean, and as we've already talked about a bunch, the, the speed run out of it is evolving literally on a daily basis. With that being said, then, for how do you prep for a run like this where some things are literally changing <laughs> every day? Is this a lot of grinding? Are you, I mean, how do you prep for a run like this? I think since it was a marathon run, the main thing I was focusing on was like, all right, let's do some no resets. Let's finish runs, make sure I'm consistently getting, you know, like decent times for like what Odyssey was back then. So that was that was my main goal. I think there was a few specific strats that I practiced as well. Like, um, I think I put a fair amount of practice into the uh, Mecha Brutal fight at the end of Bowser's Kingdom because that's always been like a constantly evolving fight that's been pretty difficult since you know day one basically. And um, yeah, that was one of the things I wanted to make sure I didn't mess up along with you know a couple others. So it, it was mainly just like no resets and practicing the things where it's like, okay, this is hard. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> yeah, and I guess you you were in a unique experience for because not only were you doing a marathon run, but you were doing a race as well. Um, Indeed. In in my experience, like when I go into marathon runs, I tend to view them as a showcase. Like you know, people mm -hmm. are probably never having seen this before. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and go all out, and if I take a couple extra, you know, minutes even on something, it's not a big deal because the the whole goal is to kind of showcase what the game can do because people have a perception of what Mario Odyssey looks like. I'm gonna shatter that expectation. That's what I'm here to do. But when you're in a race, you kind of have to be focused on consistency as well. So that's that's a little bit of Definitely. an interesting kind of addition to what you had to worry about. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, there's a couple things that I find really fascinating uh, about this run specifically at, at this time, because it really feels like it captures a moment in time for the community, um, mostly because we're seeing strats that are, some of them are obsolete at this point or have been improved quite a bit. Um, is, I, I guess, are there any nerves? Or are there any, you know, what's it like stepping onto that stage? This was our first time uh, having a GDQX, you know, this this express event at, at TwitchCon. Uh, can you take us a little bit behind the scenes and perhaps, with, you know, playing in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people and all that kind of stuff? What's that like? Um, so I had already done a GDQ run before at this point, so I wasn't as nervous as I was the first time. Because the first time I was freaking out it was something i'd never done before <laughs> and um i knew there was going to be tons and tons of people watching for this it was you know the same sort of thing but since i already had that extra experience under my belt it it wasn't you know as scary but eh, it, I, I i couldn't say i wasn't nervous you know <laughs> Uh, they definitely was. It's pretty cool seeing Spike and Triax on the uh, couch there. Is there any like, do you ever do like practice with the commentators or anything like that for a run like this? Like, what, what's the what's that side of things? Because we don't get a chance to you know hear or talk about that at all. You know, while the run's actually <laughs> happening. Um, for this run in particular, I don't think we really did anything beforehand. That being said, practice. though. Um, yeah, dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Nicro Vita's run, the very first one that was ever mm -hmm. at a GDQ, was like, I I think they 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 had this idea that they really wanted to go above and beyond with like mm -hmm. scripting how the run was gonna be was gonna go. Um, <laughs> right. It, it you know it came off as a little bit cheesy, but like charming at the same time. You know right. what I mean? Like yeah. Um, they the people on the couch obviously knew what was gonna what was gonna happen, but they would kind of set themselves up for some jokes and. Um, you know, <laughs> like, like looking back on it is like, yeah, you know, like this is Odyssey's first showcase. Like, let's let's give it our all. So, um, it, you know, mm -hmm. the dynamic there is a little bit different. Like Spike and Trihex, they kind of know what to expect. They're reacting to a race that's happening. But that first run, Micro Vita's run, I think uh, Small Ant was on the couch. I think Trihex was on the couch. And I think um, Bayleaf was on was the couch. Spike? Oh, no, no. I think you're right. I think it yeah, was, was Bayleaf. Bayleaf. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so like they they actually got together and they basically like scripted the whole run from start to finish. 
Um, so it really, yeah, there is a dynamic there, and it's like completely different. Just kind of depends on how mm -hmm. you're feeling. Um, usually when I get commentators for my runs, there are people who know the run really well, so they can kind of just like anticipate what's coming, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you had done a run before for, and then this was uh, another, this one after that. Um, what's it like playing in front of people live? It's something, I got to tell you, as, as quarantine and COVID and everything has happened, uh, I'm taking for granted nowadays. But uh, tell us a little, <laughs> what's it like actually, you know, stepping into that room and hearing uh. people cheer for you behind you and all that kind of stuff? I, I think the live stuff definitely makes it a bit weirder for sure. It's <laughs> it's a completely different environment than like because I've done if you if you count this I've done three like GDQ runs. I've done one at an AGDQ, one at a GDQX, and then I think the other was one for the online SGDQ this last summer. And the like environment of doing it online versus in person like this is just so much different because you can turn around and you can see like a crowd of people back there watching <laughs> eyeballs and, yeah and you, you can hear them too sometimes so it's it's definitely different for sure I, I think that's one of the things too that makes a race so much fun is that there's people cheer i mean most of the in fact at least my experience at all the gdqs basically they're always trying to you know root on who's ever running and stuff but the race there's just that extra added element <laughs> of the oohs and the <laughs> ahs as things go wrong or things happen great you know all that kind of stuff it's pretty cool yeah for sure is there anything that you uh, perhaps you wish you would have hit or how did you feel like your run went um i think i did o overall like okay i think i ended up having an average run but there was one instance where like Back in Lost Kingdom, um, I noticed something Nicro did wrong, and it was something I could have like said like, "Hey, um, you didn't, you know, you didn't trigger Klepto. You're gonna, you're gonna like get Cappy stolen." But I, I didn't want to say that and <laughs> have me be wrong. Oh no! Because if I told him that, and you know, I was wrong about that and I made him lose time, that would have been horrible, but because I didn't say anything, um, he ended up losing, like, a, a minute. Right, <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> I, yeah, I, I like, if, if you go back to it in the, um, the VOD in Lost Kingdom, I could, I, I, I don't know if you can tell on my face that I, I noticed something is wrong, but it was definitely awkward, because it was like, oh, this is about to happen, and I don't know if I should do something or not. <laughs> Well, that's a, that brings up a good uh, point. So when you're racing this, you can see uh, Necrovita's, like, TV or, you know, his screen, right? Yeah. That's so... Yeah, it was, like, right next to mine. I got to wonder, how often when you're racing somebody does that happen? How often are you, you're able to see, you know, quite often we're at home, right? Yeah. So, that's a good point. Yeah. So, <laughs> very um, cool. You know, I actually just thought about this, too. So the Switch is wireless controllers. Mm -hmm. um, I know that mm -hmm. when you're in the practice room at GDQs, the connection of the controllers is like it's abysmal. It's very bad. Oh, really? Um, because you've got all of these like other wireless yeah. things going on. Yes. So sometimes your controller just doesn't have like a solid Bluetooth connection to your console because it's like it's you know so bombarded by all these other signals. Did you ever like when you were in that race for? Did you experience any of that? Uh, I don't think it was that bad for this run. I remember that being something I have like worried about in the past or when i've like played on my switch in the practice room at gdq it's been like a little like i guess weirder than um it is at home but that's sort of just one of the things you have to be prepared for or get used to because even if it's not like a connection thing um if you're playing a game at gdq like you're going to be playing on like a different monitor you're going to be in a different chair you just have like this completely different environments around you and it's like it can be weird to get adjusted to, like, that new environment. Because, again, you're not in the comfort of your own home. And I think one of the nice things about GDQX is, at least my experience when I was there, is, like, there's, like, five practice, you know, TVs or whatever. It's a much smaller <laughs> thing than the <laughs> typical take up the entire, you know, conference ballroom at a, at a hotel for GDQ. Yeah. So I think that helps out a little bit as well. 
Um, any last thoughts about this run specifically? Because I, I, it's, I, it's, it, it, I remember watching it and and really enjoying the race, and I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. It's going to set the stage where we're going next and what the evolution of uh, <laughs> Mario Odyssey speed rating is going to be. But any final thoughts for her before we move on? Um, not really. I think we covered a lot of like the the interesting and fun stuff with the uh, the run and you know in regards to like this GDQ run in particular. So. I think we can move on to the next uh, the next thing awesome well folks here's what we're going to do we're going to take a quick break and when we return we're going to talk a little bit more about some different categories and category extensions <laughs> for mario odyssey we're going to be taking a look at sgdq 2021 online next which literally just happened a couple months ago so uh <laughs> don't go anywhere stick around we're gonna be back in a few minutes with some more mario odyssey with fur and dangers don't go anywhere we'll be right back Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Games Done Classic, where we're looking back at legendary GDQ moments with the legends that made them happen. Today, we are looking at Super Mario Odyssey with Dangers and Fur. Thank you so much for being here. First segment, we kind of, we've kind of we talked about the history. We've talked about all the strats and the routing and all of the, the, the things that this community has done to make this game what it is today, just four short years into its speedrunning life. <laughs> We're going to move on in here to uh, kind of like the modern or what's going on nowadays. And I think first where I think it's important to kind of start is let's talk about the categories a little bit because the run that you're looking at on the screen right now is the Taka 2% <laughs> presented by Danger just recently here at SGDQ 2021 online. And I guess, so Danger, first tell us what are some of, what are like the most uh, popular categories and then how have some of these category extensions <laughs> come about? Sure. Yeah. So um, maybe I can just give kind of like a quick crash course Please, on yeah. how um, speedrun.com leaderboards exist. So typically speedrun.com leaderboards, they exist for basically every game in existence. Um, and when you look at their page, they're going to have a, a set of categories written out that kind of go through objectives that the game sets out for you. Like the, they're, they're the least arbitrary um they're they're kind of set by the game standards so like any percent whenever you hear any percent it means to get to the credits as fast as you can like any percent meaning that you could complete you know one percent of the game or ten percent of the game as long as you're getting to the credits you win right whereas a hundred percent is like you have to collect all of the things along the way um so when you go to super mario odyssey's speedrun.com page there are six categories uh there's any percent there's world peace world peace is like completing the the main story of the game getting to the credits but also completing like the story elements as well so um you know beating the bosses and things like that uh you have dark side which is getting to the dark side kingdom which is a secret kingdom and beating that darker side which is unlocking the darker side kingdom and beating that then you have all moons which is pretty self-explanatory every single one of the moons there's 880 of them and then there's 100 percent, which is not just all of the moons it's all of the everything um, so those, you know, those are all pretty well defined by the video game, right? Um, they're all objectives that exist within the realm of the game as, you know, things that you can unlock and beat. Whereas when you get into category extensions, that's where you kind of like enter into arbitrary zone. That's where you kind of enter into like the community is getting kind of bored of the game's <laughs> objectives. So let's impose our own. For a little bit <laughs> and you know they they can be born naturally or they can be born from memes or they can be born from just about anything um just kind of you know coming up with something that seems fun to do like i think one of the very first category extensions was actually one that came out like as the game was coming out as soon as we realized that you could basically get mario's shirt off people decided <laughs> that that should be a speed run category yeah like, yeah, that was pretty quick. It was like it was like day one. Yeah, like as soon as the game came out, people were speed running how to get Mario's shirt off as fast as possible. So that's nipple percent. Um, that's a category that exists. Now I don't actually remember the birth of Taka two percent though. Um, I remember Timpani was doing it as kind of a proof of concept of just like you know we we don't have randomizers for Odyssey. The game's kind of new, so let's impose our own way of making a randomizer. So. Taka 2% is this idea that there's a little bird that lives in the kingdom, all of the kingdoms, and when you talk to him, he gives you just, he just gives you the name of a moon, um, and he can do that three times. So it's kind of like a hint system. It's like, if you don't know where moons are in the game, 
at least you have the name of it to kind of go off of to maybe help you out a little bit. And so we use like it, any of any of the moons that he gives a random, right? So it, it basically became a category that you know changed the game up every single time you played it. Um, and that's that's why it was fun. So when you when you say what are the most popular categories, definitely the main board. But category extensions are when like speedrunners kind of get tired of the grind, you know, like because it's such a grindy game and because you can hit plateaus so fast. Um, category extensions kind of spice it up a little bit, you know. As a runner of this game and somebody who grinded uh, a main category or categories, uh, when did when was the time like w at what point do you start considering, you know, <laughs> what are some of the extensions? Let's find some new ways to play this game. How long does it take you to get to that point? <laughs> Uh, I guess it really, yeah, it just, it kind of depends on, you know, how you're feeling that day, uh, how you're feeling with your performance, like, I, I don't know, maybe you can, you can relate for, but I feel like it's always this kind of like, this, this balancing game where you're kind of doing a lot of this, where, you know, you learn tricks, you learn how to save the time that you have, and then you grind your PB until you get to the, basically the precipice of what is possible with all of the stuff that you're doing, and then you got to learn some more tricks and then you can use those tricks to get better times, and then it's kind of this like rolling upwards type of movement. Um, that's kind of mm -hmm. what grinding speedruns look like. But sometimes you just kind of hit a plateau where you feel like the tricks are too hard to learn and you're not making any more improvements. So that's when the, you know, the memes kind of come in. It's like, okay, let's take, <laughs> take a step back. You know, let's not take it so seriously. Let's just, let's just try to get Mario's shirt off for a little while. Like, can we just do that? Can we just have fun taking Mario's shirt off for a while? I think let's do that, you know? So uh, for me, like, I think I kind of did it as a joke every now and then. Um, there was definitely no grinding these meme categories by any stretch of the imagination, but um, you can apply the skills you learn in the main categories and apply them here and do pretty well, right? So it's just kind of like a fun yeah. side project, I guess. For, I was going to ask you, have you ever take, tackled, I know you're doing commentary on this run, uh, have you ever uh, tackled any of the meme categories yourself or, or try to find a new different way to play the game? Uh, I've definitely done a handful of them. Like, um, the one where you take off Mario's boxers. I had world record in one of those categories at one point. Because um, there's actually two of them. One of them where you're allowed to get something called uh, Luigi Hint Arts, and one of them where you're not. And that basically just sort of changes how you have to get the 1,000 coins to buy the boxers and uh, finish the run. Yeah, even, but, though, um, even though it's not a speedrun category, uh, Fur, you also did some... You, are continuing to do some damageless stuff oh, for Mario games yeah. as well, right? So damageless is actually in the category extensions page for Super Mario Odyssey because enough people have run it <laughs> and gotten That's like right. scores, I guess you could say, to where um, the mods of the category extension decided it would go on there. But um, yeah, that's like, I guess another way you can sort of like tackle something that's like really similar to speedrunning, but still a little bit different because, you know, you're trying to play the game at a high level, but instead of going fast, it's more about like, okay, let's see how many moons we can get without taking damage once. As a fan, I know damageless runs have been around for a long, almost as long as speedrunning has been around, I would assume. Uh, however, I'm glad to see how popular they've become in the last, you know, six months-ish or year-ish. And they are, they're on, they keep me on the edge of my seat when I'm watching people play them because <laughs> at any given time, anything could happen, especially as you get an hour yeah. or longer into a run. For you, what's been your experience with the damageless runs? Is, 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 what's, the, what's the challenge like for that compared to like a speedrun? Oh, uh, it's, I, I feel like there's, I, that's a hard question to answer because, um, like, you grind it sort of in a similar way to a speedrun where, like, you'll, I guess, go live on, like, Twitch or start recording and um, you'll, like, play through the game and you'll try and, like, beat your previous best. But with, like, a damageless run versus a speed run. Like in a speed run, you can make a mistake that loses you time, but you can make up for that later. In a damageless run, when you make a mistake, if that mistake is, you know, taking damage, you have to start completely over. So while it can be really fun and exciting to tackle these runs, as you get like an hour, two hours, three hours, or like in Odyssey, um, my Odyssey All Moons Damageless time, which I've done all 880 Moons Damageless, is like nine hours. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so if you start getting like six, seven hours into a Damageless run, stuff, stuff can get pretty scary. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's see, for sure. It's like it's kind of like speed running in the sense that like if you make a mistake in speed running, sometimes you just hit the reset button because you're like, well, that's it, you know, like that's the nail in the coffin. But it's it's up to your own judgment, I think. Like I've not done damageless stuff, but the difference between speed running and damageless is like damageless has a pretty set defined rule where like if you make a mistake, it's over. Speed running, like you know, it's more of a mentality based thing where like. If you make a mistake, it might be over if you say it's over, but you should also just try and not give up until you are absolutely certain of it. Dangerous, I know you did this recently, so I do have to ask about it. You recently did, I think, was it all the major categories in one sitting? <laughs> oh, yeah. So <laughs> since we're on the topic of categories, yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. as, as a bit of a cheeky subathon goal, I decided um, let's, you know, let's do all of the main board categories, like one after the other. And so, you know, like you have to do an any percent run. Any percent is just to the credits as fast as possible. And then you restart the game from the beginning and then you do a world peace run, which is an any percent run plus the story. And then you go back to the beginning of the game again and you do dark side, which is 250 moons. And then you go back to the beginning of the game again and then you do darker side, which is 500 moons. Then you go back to the beginning of the game again and then you do all moons, which is 880. And then you go back to the beginning of the game again and then you do 100%. <laughs> Took me 26 yeah. and a half hours, by the way. <laughs> that I, that number just blows my mind, and I, I I was watching a bit, and I remember going to sleep, and then you were still streaming <laughs> the next morning. Yep, yep. <laughs> How many ha, has that been done? Is that something other members of the community have done? Because that's that just it's kind of mind boggling to think you can play the game for twenty six hours like that. Surprisingly, yes, yeah, that is something that has been done yeah. before, and the the concept of it isn't anything that special. I think right. like Super Mario World has a category extension category that's like. 960 exits or something which is literally just 96 exit 10 times in a row um, <laughs> so the concept of like playing the same game for that much time is not anything new but with odyssey because there's so much content yeah it takes a long time i think timpani kind of like timpani is a name that's come up a couple of times yeah um they they kind of have a reputation for being a speedrunner that likes to do really long categories like that they do things like 100 percent super paper mario and like they really like playing the, the game in its entirety uh they were the first one that i know that was able to complete the main board marathon and yeah it's like same thing it's like you know it, it, it wears you out because you're like yeah you know it's a new experience every time but man like <laughs> that's a long time to be gaming so definitely is a long time <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought it up, too, because it's like uh, uh, the 100% category itself is uh, around nine hours, I guess, at this point. And th th just mm -hmm. to play this game, and especially with all of the, the tricks and things that exist in it, the 100% category, one of the things I, I find fascinating about watching the 100% category is that you're still doing all of the movement tech, all of the things that you have to do in a speed run, yet you're collecting every single everything in the game. And uh, that seems... Uh, really challenging to say the least to keep it up at that level for you know I, the world records eight hours and forty three minutes but I, a lot of runs nine hours ten hours things in that range so well, that's actually Go. kind of that's kind of the beauty of like other categories in general um, the, 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 the the what you say about like having to maintain this optimization level for other parts of the game I think that that's what makes them so appealing you know I think it's really easy for people to get attached to like the the shortest version of the run like any percent is really popular because it's like the, the concept of getting to the credits is really easy to grasp, but it's also a pretty direct line. Like, you know, any percent is you are following this exact line um, and it doesn't stray from that. You don't get to see very much of the game outside of that line, right? Like you kind of got your blinders on and you're just doing what you need to complete an any percent run, whereas an all moons run is everything. Like you still have to use your movement tech and you still have to use your game knowledge and you still like there are all of these like little little tips and tricks and like little facets of the game that a lot of people don't get to see because all they see is any percent right um and that's why i like those long categories so much that's why they're they're so charming to me is because like this game can be made fast for all of the slow stuff too um and there's a lot of really cool stuff to show off you just don't get to see it unless you play those long categories so that's that's i think the the benefit of making other categories in the first place is because you can enjoy the game in different ways and still go fast so true. As I'm looking at the leaderboards, Fur, you're just above Timpani with an 856. How long were you grinding the category, mm -hmm. especially when your run is, is nine hours? How, how oh, long do you spend man. in that? So um, I, I, I don't think I would ever say 100% was like the main <laughs> sort of speed run I was approaching with Odyssey, but there yeah. was a long time where um, I was 
approaching all moons is the main mm. thing, which is, you know, it's it's sort of like 100%, but you don't have to get, like, everything. You just have to get all the moons. So, like, people usually lean more towards running that as opposed to 100%, partially yeah. because 100% has a lot of coin grinding in it. Like, mm. that's the main reason. It's, like, over an hour longer than... Um, uh, all moons yeah because you have to coin grind for like an hour yeah. plus in the run because all moons gets but, about um, like 75 percent of the purple coins in the run so most of them mm -hmm. um so yeah the only real like the major difference is buying all of the coin outfits that cost a lot of money so yeah there's yeah. a lot of coin grinding so people typically what they do is they'll grind the they'll grind all moons like if they're gonna if they're gonna yep. grind anything they're gonna grind the seven and a half hour category and then a hundred percent is kind of just an extension of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I a lot of the like a hundred percent runs or even world records I got I never really felt like they were very good compared to the all moons runs just because I had so much more fun running all moons compared to a hundred percent because you know while doing the long runs or like the full hundred percent can be you know fun it's just the coin grinding is not fun so i i really didn't like running that category much more than like a few days or something like that and then i i just get back to all moons because when i was grinding that so as we look at category extensions we're watching your run from this summer to the talk of two percent and you kind of mentioned it's set up a bit like a randomizer where it sounds like you can get any three random moons from talk of two is that accurate more or less, yeah. I mean, okay. there's a couple of restrictions. The game is kind enough to, um, you know, because we're, we're talking about progression in this game, and, like, you can achieve world peace in a kingdom, which is basically, like, beating all the bosses. Um, and then once you've gotten to the post-game, if you've achieved world peace, you can also open up this... There's a rock in every kingdom called the Moon Rock, um, and it just kind of opens up a brand new set of moons that you can collect only in the post-game. So the game at least has the kind of cognitive sense to not let Takatu give you the moons that you can't have access to yet. Like, if you haven't achieved world peace, you won't get the world peace moons from Takatu. If you haven't beaten the game, you won't get the post-game moons from Takatu. So at least he has the sense to give you moons that you can physically acquire in this moment, which is nice. Thankfully, that is a thing. That's kind of what makes it viable as a thing that you can do as, you know, like a randomizer. But yeah. Otherwise, no story moons either. He won't ever suggest anything that has to do with the story because... You know, the good game is kind of assuming that that's where you're going anyway. So he'll only as he'll only give you moons that you can get in that moment that aren't story moons, and so anything else is fair game. It's just random. So, so that uh, how does how do you prep then? Is this one of those things where are you just practicing basically every moon because it's I'm not every moon, but I mean and nearly all of them. I mean, the, it seems like prepping for something like that uh, could present a challenge to say the least. Yeah, see, that's where, like, the category like this has nothing to do with, like, practicing your movement from <laughs> point A to point B. It has everything to do with, like, you having recall on what the game is all about. Like, mm. having, you know, if you know what all the moon's names are and you know how to get there, you're going to have a much easier time than if you only do any percent runs, for example, right? Like, Pocketu and randomizers in general, I think, are more of a test of your knowledge of the game than they are of your ability to, like, precisely do it if that makes sense no it, it totally does and i think that was one of the most interesting things watching the run where i really enjoy seeing speedrunners have to like you know make some decisions uh because uh at times we can get so locked i know me personally when i'm in a if i'm grinding out a speed run i don't want to say it's formulaic but uh, there's not quite sometimes as on the fly decisions as you need to make once you've gotten something optimized to a certain degree, you know? And with right. this, it doesn't seem like any of that prep. <laughs> I mean, obviously some of it would help, but that kind of, you know, you're going to be forced in situations you're not normally forced into. And I think that's really fascinating about it. Exactly, yeah. Like, I think the the only real improv that you need to do if you're a regular speedrunner doing your regular daily grind is if you have to make a backup decision that you have never made before. But, you know, part of getting good at a speed game is preparing for that and anticipating those in the first place, right? So even though you have your line set up, you, you know, you also have your backup set up as well in case something goes wrong. Like, that's what the practice is all about. That's what it's for. Um, whereas this, like, you can't really anticipate anything. Like, Takatu's going to give you three completely random moons. You can use the story moons as, like, a guide because you're still allowed to collect them and he'll never give them to you. So you can use those as, like, a guide to kind of help you go in the direction that you want to go. But... Yeah, it's all fair game. Like, you just kind of have to know 
what you need to do to collect the moons, and that's it. Like, the rest is, you know, good luck, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Uh, we talked about this a little bit during the first segment, but I I'm curious if we could go just a little bit more in detail about the versioning in this game, because it does seem like, as you mentioned, <laughs> especially when all of you were at <laughs> GSA, uh, what is... Uh, how has the versioning impacted, and does it is the game still updated? Like, does the versioning still impact the speed run itself? Oh, there's quite a history about versioning in this game. Uh, for there since you, definitely like, is. A little bit of it <laughs> happened before I started joining. So, like, 1.2 came out, I think, in, like, March of 2018, and I wasn't playing the game yet. So maybe, for you have a little bit better of a, an understanding than I do. Oh, man, there, there's so much <laughs> that has happened with just the whole versioning thing of this game. Because right off the bat, there was, like, a day one patch for this game. So, um, like, immediately we were running on 1.1. And I, I don't entirely remember the timeline for this and whether or not uh, First Moon Skip was discovered before 1.2 came out or not. But uh, basically what happened is a runner discovered a trick that could only be performed on, like, the day one patch of the game that saved, like... Oh, how much do you know how much first moon skip saves off the top of your head dangerous it was like it's 20 like, to 25 seconds it's or like 20 like 30 seconds something like that yeah so there was this huge dilemma because the only way you could get that version back was if you had a physical copy of the game and were willing to factory reset your switch so the switch did not remember the fact that um you you know there's a newer update for this game and you should already have it yeah because the folks Cause, at home like, you know nintendo is not very <laughs> nintendo likes their games nice and polished and proper and mm -hmm. prim right um so going back to a version that isn't polished and proper and prim is not something nintendo really likes to do so the only way that you can go back to a previous version of a game typically is to just completely eliminate everything on your switch that exists <laughs> yeah. they, they hide all of their like update uh, data in a place where you can access as as a user basically so yeah so in order to get back to the i guess the original version of super mario odyssey um you needed it to not be digital because it would automatically update to the, the the most recent version and you you had to make sure that you've like had all updates off and you had a physical copy that had that version on it so um, yeah so yeah, it, so that was it was a, a point of contention. That was a controversy. <laughs> it was a point of contention because people were like, "Well, man, I have to buy the game again now, and I have to wipe my Switch." Like that doesn't sound very yeah. fun. A lot of people just like oh bought a second one if they oh had God. the privilege to be able to do that. Like they just bought a completely other console. Um, yeah, so like crazy stuff like that. And that's you know, in the name of time save, you know, it's not anything new. It's not anything Odyssey related. Like there are people who buy Japanese version of consoles, for example, to speed run the games. Mm -hmm. Like it's. It's a pretty common thing in speedrunning to, you know, seek out the hardware that caters the absolute fastest possible run that you can do. Like, that's kind of just a speedrunning thing. Yeah, I, I might be remembering this wrong, but part of me feels like the 1.2 update was sort of like the breaking point on that contention because once they updated the game to 1.2, the only way you could get the version 1.1 of the game was if you had a cartridge that had version 1.1 of the game on it and if you factory reset so that became an even like harder version to get basically yeah so, 1 so 1 i want to say getting kind of like yeah wiped. like we weren't allowed to use 1.1 because it was like the most inaccessible version 1.0 was yeah. still like the factory version of the game so you could still do the whole factory reset your switch thing and it would work fine mm -hmm. um and then 1.2 was the most um recent update and actually 1.2 is kind of what revolutionized everything 1.2 was the update that brought the game Balloon World, which is like an online function where you can talk to Luigi and then like hide a balloon somewhere in the world and then someone online can go and try and pop right, it right. and you mm. both get coins for mm. doing that. Um, they also introduced what are called like Luigi hint arts, where basically like there are hint arts in the game that display the location of moons through like kind of cheeky, you know, like hints. Um, but Nintendo started posting these hint arts on their Twitter page and if you deciphered where these hint arts were supposed to be, then you would get 200 coins and like a little 8-bit mm -hmm. Luigi would pop out. Um, so as these were getting released, um, they were giving us more coins. So it actually reached a point where playing on 1.2 was good for some versions because we were getting coins for free 
Whereas 1.0, yeah. the old version that was good for any percent was less optimal because you wouldn't be getting coins anymore. So like all moons and 100% were much, much, much faster on 1.2 because you would be getting all these coins. <laughs> this doesn't... Yeah, and I want to go back to uh, Balloon World real quick Please, yeah. uh, with 1.2. Um, so 1.2 patched a lot of glitches, specifically out of bounds glitches. And the reason for that probably was because of Balloon World. Nintendo didn't want people putting these balloons out of bounds. So all of these like glitches that worked on 1.1 that were like out of bounds glitches that helped out the speedrun got patched essentially <laughs> and it made it, you know, it just added more to the like version contention of this game and like, yeah. oh well. Funny enough, I, I guess we have to run on 1.0 now, or that's like the best way to do it. And funny enough, a lot of like they patched out some of the out of bounds stuff. They patched out some of the story progression, like skipping stuff, but not all of it. Like they made some of it mm -hmm. harder, but not impossible. So they weren't yeah. even really able to stop us from getting out of bounds, which is hilarious. <laughs> so what they ended yeah. up doing instead, which is what I think Nintendo should do for all of their online games now, by the way, is they just said, you know what? If we detect the balloon out of bounds, then we're going to ask you to try it again. So that's that was their their solution. They were like, if the balloon yeah. is out of bounds, you have to place it again. And it's like that seems that seems fair. They should have done that from the beginning, but you yeah, know, it's a much more foolproof solution. I feel. Yeah, definitely, because you know, <laughs> if basically it's just the it's just the rule of like if it if it does exist, somebody's going to be able to find out how to do it. We're speedrunners. We're we're going to get out of bounds. <laughs> you can't stop us. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree, and I think that's one thing. If I've learned anything from speedrunning, <laughs> especially in 3D environments, uh, if there is a way to get out of bounds, it'll be found. And it's just it's it's the world we live in. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention something too because the I get I get asked um, quite often, you know, hey, how do I get into speedrunning? What's some of the best ways? And I think it's important to the be the, the advice I always give is that use whatever you have. You know, like when you're trying these things out for the first time, uh, don't, don't feel like you need to get this and get that and do this and do that because, uh, you, first of all, you may not know if you like it or not. So, first of all, just try some things, try whatever you have, and then as you get into the higher echelons, uh, typically what I talk about is like the top 10 in most competitive games. If you get to that echelon, that's when you want to start looking at investing in other hardware or something like that because that's a that's a big that's a big financial commitment at times. So, it's like... Oh, totally. You, yeah, People having switches only for 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 a one game. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> nice that if I, if I if some of us could do that. But it's it's for the most and when you get to that level, you're looking to do something like that, you know. So, yeah, and what and, you know, at the end of the day, you consider how much time it's actually saving. And we're talking right. about like maybe 10, 15. <laughs> I guess for the case of 1.0, it was like 30 seconds total. But yeah. you know, when you first start out, 30 seconds is not going to make the difference between like your first run and the world record, right? Like. If you if the, if the world record is like 100 and your first run is like a 130, 140, 150, maybe two hour time, that 30 seconds isn't going to help you, right? It doesn't matter. Um, so it's the same as all hobbies, right? Like if you want to get mm -hmm. into drawing, you need a pencil and paper. You don't need like an expensive drawing tablet, for example. Like, <laughs> like you know, all hobbies are going to be like that. Uh, there are even things that are for complete free that I wouldn't recommend doing right off the bat, like. Playing this game in, in Chinese is the fastest way to play the game, but if you don't know how to navigate the menus, you're going to get frustrated because you're like, well, I need to reset my run, but I don't know how to get there because I'm in Chinese. <laughs> so, like, start your speed runs in English and then switch over to Chinese when you remember the, the menus, right? Like, definitely, definitely, you know, <laughs> do, do what is available to you and what's easiest until you can kind of graduate into that when you actually put some passion into it, right? I wanted to ask you about that, Dangers, because I noticed that you played this run on the English version, and I was curious yes. why that was chosen. And, you know, because we first run, I believe you were playing the Chinese ver or the Japanese version. Was it Japanese or Chinese? I can't remember which the text was on. But uh, um, there's this a story is, to that. We'll get please. to it in a second. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, this, the honestly, the simple answer for this, for this run in Takatu, um, I play in English because I can read English. Takatu <laughs> is a bird that literally speaks whatever language you have set, right? So if he's mm -hmm. giving me, like you can see right here on the screen, a treasure made from coins, if that was in Chinese, I wouldn't know what moon that is, right? So the reason that we play Takatu in English is because I can read it. So you would play in whatever <laughs> your local language is, right? Um, would it be faster to play in Chinese? Technically, yes. Um, <laughs> but until I learn Chinese, I'm not getting that time save, you know what I mean? So uh, when yeah. it comes to having to actually understand the game, you know, you, you're kind of limited by that, right? But 
um, yeah, so Japanese is probably the language you saw for in micro playing in the last run. Uh, it definitely was. It yeah. definitely was. Because back then, yeah. people thought it was still the fastest. Oh, so it, but, it was very weird. We we must have done like some preliminary language testing and just decided outright that, yep, Japanese is the fastest. <laughs> um, Chinese <laughs> is the fastest for the first three kingdoms, but we're not going to test past that. We don't need to. We just know that Japanese is the fastest. <laughs> we're just, that's all. Oh, uh, it wasn't man. until like I think early 2020 or something like that that we decided right. to retest all the languages, and it was like, <laughs> so we all got bamboozled by that. It was like, oh, thank you for the free second of time save that we've <laughs> all been completely avoiding, and it's so funny that speedrunning yep. happens like that, right? Like something sitting like right out in the open that we all just take for granted is just you know shatters our expectations of the game completely. So. I think. I think running in the 2D section as Bowser was one of those things. Yeah, true. Because if you look at some really early speedruns of Super Mario Odyssey that are, like, world record level, and I mean, like, really early, I'm pretty sure people were not running in the 2D section as Bowser at the very end of the speedrun. Because they didn't and know you could? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, like, such a simple thing. Just press Y on the controller and you'll run, but no, speedrunners just weren't really doing it. So... It yeah, that happens. It never ceases to amaze me how sometimes, you know, the most obvious, not but maybe not the most obvious, but something so obvious can take some time because we're, we're you know, especially as a speeder and you get so focused on something, right? So, you know, you got movement, 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 or whatever it might be, or l learning a new route or whatever. But sometimes, hey, the most basic thing, let's just check the language. Let's see what that does. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I, I guess, let's talk a little bit about this run, uh, Dangers. Um, anything that uh, was a bit unexpected, or, or what was some of the highlights for you as far as uh, you, you know your run here being performed? You're honestly asking this question at the perfect moment because <laughs> what you're seeing on the screen right now is my visit to the Deep Woods, which um, <laughs> very famously uh, got out of hand very fast. <laughs> um, I needed to get this moon called Treasure Made from Coins, which you need to find the coin coffer and you need to feed this plant 500 coins. But I had roused the suspicion of the dinosaur, so the dinosaur was like chasing me around the kingdom while I was trying to do this. Uh, it was very like, you know, have the Benny Hill theme going on in the background um, kind of moment. It was great. Um, so that obviously stuck out in my mind a little bit. Um, but you know, you're at the whim of the RNG in this run, so... You're just kind of like, what moons am I going to get? And when I went into this run, there were a lot of moons that I wanted to get because I was like, okay, it'd be really cool to be able to show that off. I hope I get that moon. <laughs> like, this trick is really cool. If they give me this moon, then I get to show off this trick, and I'm going to feel really happy about it. Um, so there were a couple of moments like that. I think I got um, I Feel Underdressed in Lake Kingdom, which you're going to see coming up pretty soon here. Lake Kingdom is right after Wooded. Um, it's just like a clip into the wall. So, like... You know, whenever I go into these showcase runs, it's like, what, especially if it's random, I guess, it's like, what can I do to showcase this game the best that I possibly can? Like, I don't need to, I don't, this doesn't need to be a world record speed run. This just needs to be a run that impresses people by showing off what it can do. So, um, I think that this run did a really good job of that, I think, because, you know, I, I ended up getting some good RNG, not necessarily because the moons were fast, but because they were cool to show off. So. Totally agree with that. And I wanted to ask you about, you know, doing this uh, from your home <laughs> where you live, uh, because yeah. one of the things I, I personally, I, I miss being around folks and seeing people. One of the things I, I mention on this show all the time, but that one of the great things about a GDQ is that uh, a lot of times it's a big hang for all speedrunners who don't see each other during the year. <laughs> we get a chance to all hang out and talk about and play the game that we love or whatever, you know, this and that. It's, just a, it's a really good hang. Um, and that kind of gets a lost a little bit in the online version. But in the online version of GDQs, we get to see things we might not normally otherwise get to see, and people get to participate who might not otherwise get to participate. Uh, how is the, because now that you've done a couple of these, how is the online experience for you, and does that feel any different to you? <laughs> Well, the online experience, like, I have a couple of marathon runs under my belt now, and they've all been online. Like, I don't, unlike Fur, I haven't actually had the experience of being able to do a run in person yet. I really hope that that opportunity does come one day, uh, you know, knock on wood. But right. um, <laughs> uh, I would really love the experience of being able to do one of these runs in person because I think that would add an extra layer to what the experience is like. But, um, you know... There's, I, I personally feel a little bit of nerves when it comes into when it comes to doing okay. these kinds of runs. Yeah, no, yeah, no matter what, like you know that 
your your talents, the things you've been working on, are being put to the test a little bit, and everybody's watching. So there's there's a little bit of nerves there. It gets a little bit easier every time you do it, of course. Um, but yeah, it's all just kind of about you know putting your best foot forward and just showing what you do, and you know the, the people that are there are watching because they're interested. So you you, you kind of keep that in mind, and you're just like, yeah, that's fine. As far as like the online versus the in person, like yeah, I, I'm right there with you. Like I, I definitely <laughs> want to see the, the the people, like the 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 whole going in person thing. What that elevates is like, not only are people watching you for what you like to do, but you're also getting to interact with them one on one. Like, GDQ for me is more than just the stream room, and I'm sure a lot of people can agree with mm -hmm. me when when I say that. It's like going to a GDQ is an experience all in itself, not just because you get to watch the runs live and sit in a chair and it's happening right there in front of you, but because you then get to you meet the, that same person in the hallway and have a conversation with them and like talk about the passion that is speedrunning. So, for I'm curious from your perspective, you got a chance to do commentary on this run, but you have that experience mm -hmm. doing both and on, online and live uh, runs and gets commentating. Uh, any difference for you? Is, it, is there any difference like being able to read chat and things like that? I'm just curious if that's affected or um, changes the experience for you at all. Not really. Like sometimes in like some of the more like casual like hot fix stuff um it can be fun to like look at chat see what people are saying <laughs> or like i i've even hosted for um one of the in-person gdqs before and it was sometimes fun to like peek over at chat while like stuff was going on and see what so, people were saying yeah. <laughs> that's such a good point yeah it's, it's it's all it's all a good time for sure Absolutely. And one of the things I got to also point out is that we've still been able to raise like millions of dollars for charity, even in the online, uh, uh, you know, venue. And I, and I think that's pretty awesome and pretty great. I mean, uh, especially uh, Odyssey is a really popular game. So the fact that uh, you could see the ticker moving up here are dangerous. I, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's in the tens of thousands that you're able to raise just during your, your run. I mean, that's uh, pretty cool. I've seen you do other charity events, and uh, I, I got to assume something like that's pretty important, but probably to you too as well, for to be able to do something and support something like that. 100%. Yeah, it's definitely cool. Um, and uh, the Odyssey community really does show up. Um, I, I, in my experience... Like obviously the speedrunning community, when they they rally behind GDQ, they do a really good job of like, you know, raising the funds like in the millions, literally in the millions every yeah. single time they host one of these major events. Um, but the Odyssey community uh, like is always kind of blown away my expectations. Like it's probably one of the most wholesome communities I've ever been a part of. Just full stop. Um, whenever there's a charity event and Odyssey is featured, um, the the community shows up and goes above and beyond. I remember going to PAX Australia for uh, my, my friend Tom. She had a run there. Uh, he wanted me to be on the couch. And I think we were like probably three quarters of the way through the marathon, but just that Odyssey run alone boosted the counter of the like the, the money raised by double. Um, it was it was wild. It was sensational. Like the Odyssey community just like goes above and beyond when it comes to these charity efforts. And it like it it's heartwarming stuff. Like I, I don't know what else to say about it, really. At this point, I shouldn't be surprised, but when I was doing some of my research for this uh, show, the Odyssey speedruns for GDQ's channel on their YouTube channel are some of the most viewed runs of all time on GDQ's channel. And, you know, I've always loved the game, but, you know, it's great to see that the community shows up and supports. And I think that's such a big part of it as well. I think that's why we're going to continue to see Odyssey speedruns, especially with the amount of meme categories you all got nowadays. It's uh, <laughs> There's plenty other runs yeah, to there's showcase. there's a few. <laughs> Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> that actually leads to a really good point. What's next? Because I, I'm surprised. I shouldn't be surprised, but it seems like you know new things are. St we're still seeing people compete at the highest level for this game, which I know I shouldn't be surprised by it. But the game's four years old now, and th th we're still seeing new PBs and new people join the top ten, and all these kind of things happen on the leaderboards. Is there any guess as to what might be next? I mean, is there going to be new tech? Is there going to be new discoveries? What's what's left for the game? I mean, there's got to be something. What do you think for? I think I have an answer for this, but what oh, do you think? Do you? What's next? I mean, that's that's a really hard question to answer because with speedrunning, you really never know what's going to happen because, like, literally anything could happen. Um, like, with this game, everything that's happening right now is just, like, the movement and everything is just getting so, so optimized. I guess when you ask this question, what I'm thinking about is like, what's going to be the next discovery for this game? Because I feel like there has to be something. It, it, 
like with other like popular titles on the Switch, like Breath of the Wild, it feels like they're discovering like crazy new tech every <laughs> every like few months still. Right. But um, yeah, we'll just I, I feel like there will probably be some discovery. I just don't don't know what yet. Well, that's just it, right? I think that uh, Odyssey it's a relatively new game. I think we're mm -hmm. approaching four years now. Uh, it's just about to have its anniversary again here. So yeah, four years. Um, and it's it's begun to settle into that kind of territory that Mario games settle into, which is we've discovered what the most optimal way to move and what the most optimal tricks are in basically every scenario. And you have a bunch of really optimized runners who are trying their best to emulate what that perfection looks like. Um, and a change in the run, like a huge time save in the run, isn't really going to happen at that in that any percent category anyway, unless something's discovered. Um, it's just a matter of time when, like Super Mario 64 literally just discovered a clip <laughs> like last week. And Super Mario 64 is a game yep. that's 25 years old. So like anything is possible, anything can be found. It's just a matter of like, you know, people pushing the right buttons in the right places to figure it out. So it's, you know, I'm not scared about like it, the game dying. It never will, never, like that's just not how speed games work. Um, but I think that if you are looking to maybe push the boundaries on something right now, if you're not a top runner in any percent, the categories that are changing the most are the longer ones because they're the ones that have more dynamic pieces, especially in a game like this. Like I said, it's like connecting the dots, right? When you have 880 dots, that's a lot <laughs> of like variance. That's a lot of like, well, what if we do the dots in this order instead? It's like, oh, we just save five seconds by doing that, right? So if there are routing changes, if there are discoveries being made, they're happening in the longer categories because there's so much shifting around in those categories to make them different. And just like... I feel like a routing change in all moons happens like every month or so just because there are some dedicated people who are playing that very complex game of connect the dots and are finding new things all the time. So it just depends on what category you're dealing with, right? Right. And I think your comparison to Mario 64 is really a good one because I think it, in Mario Sunshine, all of like the 3D Marios basically where there, there's, it seems like there's always going to be a way to optimize some of the things you're already doing. I think that's the reason we see so many of you continue to grind the game because uh, the thing I hear quite so often all the time after a, a world record or a PB or anything like that is, well, I left some time on the table with this or with that and this, you know, <laughs> which is as a viewer and as a fan, it's like, it's almost unbelievable because <laughs> you don't believe the things you're seeing. But I guess that's just kind of the speedrunner thing, right? That's, that's how we approach it <laughs> kind of thing. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, because I mean... Speedrunning is a game of perfection, right? Like when you go into a speedrun, you are anticipating what you have achieved in practice, which is perfection. Like anything deviating from that line that we were talking about is considered a mistake, right? So um, that's that's how speedrunners look at their runs. And so that's whenever you like see a world record speedrun submitted on speedrun.com, it'll usually be like, oh, there was this mistake and this mistake and this mistake and this mistake. It'll be like almost like a grocery list of things that went wrong. Um, right. And they're just kind of calculating like how far away they are from perfection, right? So. Um, you know, they're in that regard, optimizing, like you will never have a perfect run. Right. Like there mm -hmm. are games that are getting pretty close, but those games are really old. Super mm -hmm. Mario Brothers is 35 years old and they are within like half a second of tasks now. Yeah. It took them that long to get that, that far away, right? Like <laughs> decades, yes. <laughs> even the most perfect games are still not perfect mm -hmm. and they never will be, I think. So that's kind of the beauty of speedrunning, right? Such a great point. And there's something I did want to hit before uh, we start to wrap this thing up. And I think this is an important aspect uh, to this whole thing as well. Because to your point, <laughs> the, uh, the speedrunner brain, brain is that, oh, man, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. There's, there's better things I can do. Both you and Fur have taken time away or, you know, put the game down for a bit here and there. Uh, Fur, I'll start with you. Um, what led you to finally take a break from the game? And do you plan to return ever? I mean, is it a game that you're ever going to put down type um... of thing? See, I, I think I actually got asked a really similar question on stream recently. Oh, and, like, with a speed run, like any speed run, like, when I set it down and take a break from it, the intention, like, usually isn't ever like, oh, I'm never going to play this again. Or it's like, oh, I'm, it's, it's also not the opposite of that, where it's like, oh, I'm going to pick this back up in, like, a week. It's just like, okay, I did this. I had a lot of fun with it this is what I think I want to do next. And then when I finish that, we'll see what I want to do after that and so on and so forth. So like right now, all I'm really doing with Odyssey is I'm playing like all moons once a week 
as sort of like a chill, fun thing since I have a big history with that category. Um, but when it comes to like reapproaching this game as a speedrun or as some other challenge, like it's not currently on my agenda, but there's any, at any point in the future, I could just decide, hey, there's this thing in Odyssey I could do that I haven't done before that'd be really fun. Or like, hey, maybe I can revisit this other category I didn't give as much attention to and grind that for a bit on stream. Like, you, you never really know. It's a really good point, and I, I, that's I can totally relate to. <laughs> you know, even though we, I may take a break <laughs> from a game, you never really, it's, it's tough to put a game down, especially when you put so much time into it, right? I mean, at this point, the amount, the amount of hours you put into the game, <laughs> can't even probably, uh, can you even take a guess? I mean, it is thousands, right? Probably like 5,000 oh or something. <laughs> it's high. It's up there. Dangerous, how about you? I know you've been playing. I, it's been really fun watching you play Galaxy recently, but uh, how, how, what, same question to you. Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you have to remember that you're still playing games, right? You're still... Yeah. The, the objective of this all is to have fun. Um, and I think that part of what makes you realize that you need a break is that you get caught up in it becoming more than that. You, 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 you kind of put more importance on it than it being a game anymore. Uh, a lot of people get burnt out, right? That's kind of like the main reason that you might see somebody step away is because they have pushed themselves into into that like you know the, we were talking about the perfectionist mentality where like you're keeping track of your mistakes and stuff like that you know if you let yourself go down that path and you, like you kind of put your blinders on and that's all you're thinking about that can become toxic for you after a while right so a lot of people tend to take breaks because they are forcing themselves to a point where it's not fun anymore they just lost the passion for it right and you don't want mm -hmm. that to happen um and there are lots of ways for in in my ex experience anyway to kind of mitigate that from happening um, so, you know, different categories is a great idea. Like if you push yourself to a plateau in any percent, you know, take the skills that you've learned at any percent, apply them to world peace, boom, you're getting PBs again that, you know, that you've refreshed that kind of excitement in yourself again, and you're still playing the same game. You're just applying your skills differently. And that, that's a great way to kind of rotate through and keep it feeling new. Um, and in my case, playing new games, right? Like I, one of my goals is to be good at all the Mario games eventually. Right. I think that's. Uh, I love Mario. It, it's resonated with me ever since I was a little kid, and I love the games to pieces. So the best way that I can kind of show that uh, to myself is by getting good at them all. So change games, right? Change games, change categories, keep it fresh, keep it fun, right? So it's not necessarily, I, th I feel like a lot of people have this kind of perception that like you get it to a point where you absolutely hate it and you never want to do it again. It's like, it's not that. Just like, you know, you just, you just want to keep having fun. At, at the end of the day, you just want to keep having fun. Um, will they come back to Odyssey one eventually? I mean, if it's in the cards, if Odyssey is fun, and it, you know, every time I do a showcase like this, it always ends up being fun, and I'm like, man, I, I really want to get back into that grind. Like, I, I kind of miss it, but um, you know, you gotta, you just gotta keep it going at your own pace to keep it fun. And to that point, I think a good shout out to make as well is that if you, let's say you've played through Odyssey and you're looking for a new way to play it, uh, consider look at all these different categories, look at the speed run. I. I got to tell you, as somebody who still hasn't collected all the moons, but would like to at some point, uh, just the idea of, you know, the Takatu sounds like a kind of, such a fun category, even just to do casually, because it's kind of a different way to play through the game. And I think that's, you know, if you're looking to, if you still enjoy the game like I do, like I just love moving around Mario in this game. It, nothing feels like Mario in Odyssey. And uh, don't get me wrong, I love Mario 64. I love uh, 3D World. I love all these other Mario games, but nothing feels like this game does. <laughs> and so... <laughs> There are many different, unique, and different ways to play the game, and this is just another aspect of speed running it with all these different categories is one way to do it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, we've hit quite a bit. I think uh, I think we're going to call it there. I, it's been so much fun going through the history and reliving the the, the whole four years that has been Mario Odyssey speed running. Uh, Fur, why don't we start with you? Where can people find you, and what are you doing nowadays on your stream? So you can find me at twitch.tv slash fur underscore. And uh, most recently, I have been pursuing the challenge of beating Super Mario 3D World Damageless. So I've already done Damageless Odyssey, so I've been trying to do the same thing with 3D World where I collect all 380 stars without taking damage. And currently my PB is 347, which means I only have two levels left in that run, but I unfortunately took damage. But... Yeah, we're getting really close, so I'm thinking, like, any day now it could happen. You never really know, but that's sort of, like, my main 
stream sort of speed run challenge project I've been doing recently. Yeah, he's on the precipice, like it's gonna happen any day. I watch it. Yeah, day, we're really so close. I, I'm hoping it happens. <laughs> Three forty seven is like heartbreaking. Oh my gosh. How how long is yep. that? How many hours is that in? Um it's not as long as all moon sandwiches, but that was like four hours oh. and like 40 minutes into the run or something like that. 347 means like, you're like a couple levels away from World Crown, right? Oh, man. It's it's in World Crown. Oh, you were in World Crown. Oh, yeah. No. yeah, so there was... I was I was in the second to last level I had to do. It was the Mystery House in yeah. World Crown was the level I took damage on. And then after that was Champion's Road, and that's the last level, so... Dangers, how about you? Uh, where are you at, and what are you playing recently? Twitch.tv slash Dangers, just like it's written on the screen. Um... And I do a little bit of variety, but mostly, primarily, Mario speedrunning. Um, mostly Galaxy lately. Um, like I said, the main goal being get good at all the Mario games, so I'm kind of tackling them one at a time. I was doing a, the Any% percent run for Galaxy for a while. I broke into the top 15 uh, just recently, so I've switched gears and I started doing 120-star runs, which is about a six-hour speedrun. Um, and I love Galaxy. Galaxy, like, it might be the slowest-paced 3D Mario game, but what you do just like breaks the game so fundamentally it just like bends your mind in a way and you're like you're just like you're just making a joke of this game and i <laughs> love that so 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 much so that's what i'm doing on my channel right now is 120 galaxy speedruns i gotta tell you just as a fan when i'm watching you and others speedrun that game it looks like you're honestly trying to like just off yourself so often you're making these jumps into <laughs> things that look like you're just gonna die <laughs> in some but cases no. we literally are in other cases yeah it's like wait the level's over. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're just skipping the whole thing. Great. <laughs> Pretty great. Uh, one more quick question, and I, Dangerous or for you can answer this one. Where could be, if people are interested in this game and they want to start, you know, we've talked about the community so often and how wonderful and great it is. Where is a good place for people who are interested, want to get involved in the community to maybe learn the speed run? What's a good place to go for that? Burr, you want to? Well, um, the first thing I always tell people is to join the Super Mario Odyssey speedrunning Discord. Uh, I feel like almost every single speedrun has, like, speedrun community has a community Discord at this point, yes. and it is a great way to get involved, find resources, and, you know, stuff like that. But if you want, like, a more specific, like, hey, where can I, you know, find some resources for learning categories in this game? Well, there's two really good tutorial series out there. There is one by Tom Shi, which is... Um, a bit more modern and was made more recently that is in any percent tutorial and i think tom she has some other really good tutorial content on his channel for this game and then there's also an older tutorial by small ant so if like tom she's tutorial isn't working out for you you do have that second option as well and then there's like all these other miscellaneous <laughs> tutorials that have been made throughout the game's existence that you can probably find just by like asking people in the discord like i have a random tutorial that i made on a seaside route that still holds up pretty decently today so yep. there's there's just so many resources in this game if you want to learn to speed run super mario odyssey join the discord uh, just heck you could probably just tell people what you're interested in and they could probably <laughs> shoot you in the right direction <laughs> absolutely yeah like the you know speedrunning communities have always been about collaboration uh there is an element of co like competition because there's a leaderboard and you're trying to get up on it but like it's not about trying to like one up your neighbor. It's not trying to like, you know, rub it in their face or anything. Right. Like no speedrunning community that I know of operates on that faction. Like it's all collaborative. If a discovery is made, usually there's a community that you can share that with and everybody can kind of build on that. And it's, you know, it's helping each other pull each other up. And, you know, I, I can't really think of a different way to express what speedrunning community at, at large is all about, if not that. And Odyssey just so happens to be one of the biggest ones. So you're, you know, you're in the right place if you want to. If you don't know a speed game, and you're like, I want to try something, I just don't know where to start. Like Odyssey is probably a pretty good place to start because of just how, you know, how expansive the the knowledge is and how many people are willing to help. Uh, thanks for shouting out those tutorials as well, for because that's actually some of the stuff for the research I did for today's episode, and it was really helpful just hearing people talk through some of the things, and including, by the way, both yours and Danger's uh, YouTube channels as well, because there's just there is so much out there, and to your point, it keeps evolving. So if you're at all interested, in this you know you you can get info and get into this. The, the barrier to entry is basically that you have the <laughs> game at this point. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
It's pretty cool. Thank you so much both for being here, folks. Um, my name's Lat Mackey, and I host a, a, a podcast that is similar to this. If you're all interested in this kind of content, if you go to sequencebreakpodcast.com, you can, Dangerous has actually been a guest on that podcast. And if you're all interested in stuff like this, I do a, an interview about twice a month with different speedrunners, tassers, developers, all different sorts of people who are members of our community. So if you're at all interested in that, sequencebreakpodcast.com. And uh, stay tuned, folks. In just about an hour from right now, we are going to keep our Saturday going here on the GDQ Hotfix with That's Never Happened Before, a show about glitches and how they work that will be featuring Spiro 1 and Deomon. It should be a, if you've ever seen uh, Deomon run the game, it's really awesome and it's a lot of fun. You should really stick around uh, to take a look at it. Thank you all so much for being here. Do this show about once a month if we can, sometimes twice, depending on uh, what the availability is in the GDQ schedule. Thank you all so much for watching um you this show doesn't happen without your help and with your support for those of you that have donated on the bits and the subs and all that kind of stuff it all goes to support this content that you're watching right now so thank you so much for making shows like this and all weeks of programming here at uh, the gdq hotfix happen so thank you thank you hope you enjoy your weekend and i hope to see you next time on games and classic have a good rest of your weekend see you all later bye bye see you later take care <laughs>